let us click this magic button and sure your keyboard is loud today it's very loud let me just do the we are live oh let me, let me mute myself while i yes thank you doctor i really want to hear less of you it's now so nice and quiet in my head all alone la -di da cool um uh now i have to grab my dog as well so while we're waiting for everybody to join us quickly okay. i am quickly going to run that way two seconds and back okay Cobus is Cobus is getting the third presenter in or getting her out i think um oh. as, as she as she apparently wants to try to leave the room hello and welcome to another edition of the not being streaming dev beard ops with not Cobus <laughs> and not darko uh this is uh the weekly stream video podcast whatever you would like to call it where two bald bearded guys talk about technology usually devops and aws cloud type of things and remember it's the beard on the inside that counts um yes. so <laughs> today we are starting off a different topic um if you have followed us yes. for the last two weeks we've been talking about code testing strategies and how you should mm. test your code and where should you test your code and that testing is important yeah um but today Kovas, what are we going to talk about today There's yes so <laughs> yes hi my name is strategies and this is my co-presenter deployment. deployment um yes today we are going to be talking about now you've that you've got your code well tested and you're sure that it works because remember you can always do that before you deploy no you can't um <laughs> we are going to talk about all the different ways you can go about deploying it and what we're going to do is we are going to be pulling from experience that we've had um and we're going to start off at the what i called in the title the, the yellow deployment strategy which is basically doing it by hand doing it in a way that is literally just throwing the code at the server there yeah. are a couple of ways you can do that and there are a couple of ways that the, those things are terrible and how they can go terribly wrong um i'll also recount one of the other stories that i've shared before um in terms of like how rough it can be, um, and we'll get to that. Um, so to kick things off, Darko, tell us about your most fun YOLO deployment style that you had. Actually, let's do two things. The worst one from like many years back before okay. you knew better, and then one that you thought was good for that time, given let's say constraints, because I've got a, okay. a, a nice story about my first proper deployment system okay. like years ago. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, uh, first off, as any stream we start, uh, just let us know if the audio is okay, because we can hear oh, yeah. each other well, very good. I just want to make sure that we're relatively equal when it comes to sound um, loudness. Uh, so just let us know so we do not, don't, don't sound uh, off. Yes, not Kobus, that's me, or Darko, or Deployment, whatever you like to call it. I love the comment here. <laughs> the Beard Brothers Deployment and Strategies. We look like a crime duo. Um, so let's talk about um botched deployments that i've worked on mm. and if you've been in the industry long enough and when i say long enough i mean just a couple of years uh <laughs> because it, it has changed really fast you have experienced potentially something like this now let me set the scene i was a system administrator or uh, they would call it a system administrator 2 in the company i worked for and um 2.0 2.0 yes and mm. uh we've uh uh, we were split into the groups of like system admins, network admins, and um, we call them application folks, the developers, basically folks who are building this uh, in-company uh, application. And if I recall correctly, it was written in Java. Now, me and Java are just not the best of friends. And um, <laughs> what happened is that <laughs> my job was like when the application folks would develop a specific feature set or a new version of the application, my job was as a sysadmin, because I guess that's what sysadmins do, was to deploy that piece of software. That's pretty simple enough, right? Yeah, of course. And um, you, uh, I, basically, we had a bunch of servers, virtual servers running under Citrix, if I recall correctly. And these were some application servers, Microsoft servers where we would deploy the specific Java application. And I would get this piece of code, this compiled version and a whole bunch of libraries that go along with, along with it. And um, it was a Friday afternoon because of course it was a Friday afternoon. Uh, it was a deadline by Monday, we needed to have the application out. Friday afternoon, hey Darko, can you please go ahead? This is tried and tested, deploy it to production. It's, I had 20, I was 22 years old. I, had, I knew no better. Um, <laughs> They come out and uh, <laughs> give me the application on a, on, a, on a shared disk. 
and I copy it to the server. I log into a server, basically drag and drop the application, start it off, that's fine. Ask them, hey, is this good? It's good, perfect. Saturday rolls around, rolls around. it's not good. <laughs> Actually, uh, because users started using it, <laughs> it started breaking down. It started having per performance problems because your application might work unless it's in production. <laughs> so uh, we deployed it, um, we deployed it, and well, actually I deployed it, and the, I was immediately asked on Saturday, hey, roll back, this doesn't work, let's get the old version out, old version back in. The problem was, is um, I overwritten the old files. I basically went in, dragged, dropped the new version over all the other things, and I had to roll back to the old version. So I manually, like I had copies of the old version somewhere, right, on the file, file share. The problem was some libraries that were extra were there. Uh, I missed some of the old libraries. So I actually spent most of the day trying to gather what exact things do we need for the old version. By the way, we didn't have a source controlled version or, or anything like that. No Git, no SVN, nothing. It was a, you know, a folder on a shared drive. <laughs> and I think I spent a good part of that weekend. I think Monday morning was when we actually finally managed to revert to the old version. And oh. uh, um, yeah, <laughs> um, code is never tested until it goes to production. So oh, uh, yeah. no matter no matter how the <laughs> folks were how how much the folks were certain that hey this will work good, it did it oh. at the end. And the, the 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 problem lay back on me because we had no automated deployment strategies. The deployment strategy was. Yeah, boy. And, and that's it. So, uh, See, that's why we call them deployment. Exactly. That's why we call them deployment. And Cobus has a strategy, apparently. Wait, um, wrong side. That's right. It's mirrored. It's weird. <laughs> yeah. So so that was like my my, my first time. I was mm. like, I'm never going to do this again. I, I was like, mm. this is bad. And I, and I asked them, like, why didn't you test your code? It's like, we did. How? And, okay. okay to be it honest, compiled. I, yeah, it compiled. To be honest, like, I didn't know any of this back then. I was... <laughs> I was I was I was a uh, I was ways away from from all of this and like like mm. Fallon, Fallon says here like what advice would I give myself like automate everything please don't do anything by hand no matter how simple it looks like you think like oh well it's just a drag and drop I'll just get mm -mm. the new version of mm -mm. it mm. Um, mm -mm. Mm -mm. no and and the, and the thing is mind you even if, once I've deployed the application I didn't know it was broken I had no idea that it didn't work and for if for some reason. I wasn't on call that weekend. Um, <laughs> they wouldn't be able to reach me and, oh, yeah. and get me to fix it because I had no idea that it was broken. So I basically just got a page early in the morning Saturday that it is a problem. So, oh, uh, nice. But uh, so no. the, the the main takeaway from this one, I also had a um, similar incident at some point, is that when when you start off at the very like lowest level of deployment of literally just getting yeah. files onto the server, adding is easy. Adding is removing easy. not so much that's the problem <laughs> um and i've had that before as well for example old logo files old libraries yes. yes old code pages because if you did something like let's say with php and you've got some kind of auto routing set up that page will still be there if you didn't delete the file guess what yep. it's gonna run um so at the very least have something that syncs the files to the location for you with delete because yep. that's the important part but i mean still it's um this is still in the like the yellow deployments where it's this it is. potentially downtime where you might maybe stop the web server, chuck the new files in, start the web server, or yeah. if you are really brave, you just you know throw them across and uh, hope I, things work and reload. Yeah, and, and lucky for me and for the organization, we could have had downtime. Like we worked only during the day, so it's not a global thing. Um, in the evenings, we could easily have downtime to for for proper deployments and testing. But it was, as you say, a very YOLO uh, type of deployment mm -hmm. where I just copied the code and because they told me it works. <laughs> um, trust yeah. but verify, please. Trust but verify. <laughs> well, so uh, they're basically the the two lies the developers will always tell you. The first one is that yeah, this deployment will work, and the second one is if you want to know how long something is going to take. If they tell you it's going to be quick and it's going to be easy, you know they don't know what they're doing <laughs> because <laughs> everything in development takes longer than expected. Um, I initially, when I gave estimates, was like, yeah, it'll take me a week. Then I started to learn better. Then I said, okay, well, whatever I think it's going to take, double it. And then later, as a much more seasoned developer, um, I either tripled or quadrupled it. Just yeah. because something will always come up. 
It's Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, before we continue, I just want to say hello everybody to chat. There's a bunch of uh, yes. Here. Hello everybody. And Edwin. Have, hey Edwin. Hey, we have Edwin from Ghana. Hey Edwin. Hi hi hi. Uh, we have fallen here. Um, oh okay. It's gonna be actually recorded. If you have a look at this, it's on the YouTube well, channel. So I updated the graphics. Wait, this is, this mirroring right. thing is very yes. weird up here. Yeah. yeah. You can now find the final location for all of our streams if you want to yeah. go rewatch some of them. Yeah, the recordings yeah. are gonna be there. Absolutely. Um, yeah. But cool. Let me ask you now. So manual deployments are a thing. And and let's not play the high card here. No, There's no, no, no. Always no. a manual deployment. And somebody commented hmm. here, I think William, William, yeah. SCP counts as deployment strategy. It does. You know, I, I still work with some folks who who need FTP access to a server to deploy their code. Yep. Yep. And 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 you know, that's just a rea reality of things. Now, we should try to uh, teach people to not do it that way because that's not the best way to do it. Um, so, so when you do things manually, Kobus, how would you approach this in a in a in a very ma like let's say you have to do it manually? Yes. Um, how would you how would you instruct young Darko to do it manually? So let me tell you about what we had. How many years ago? Okay, now 16, 15 years ago, sixteen, depending on how you count. Um, so the thing is, remember, when you want to deploy, you want to have whatever's there yeah. to be replaced with something else. And you want a safety net. So at the very, very least, what you need to do is to either keep the current deployment intact and actually put the other one down next okay. to it and then start that version up. So, for example, use folders with some leaks. Or if you need to put them in the same folder, because there are sometimes those kind of limitations where you don't have full access to the web server yes. where here's your deployment folder and that's it. What you would do is step one, take whatever is there, zip up the entire thing and store that at least somewhere we've got a backup of it. With, yep. and here's a pro tip, commands ready to unzip and replace the bad version you just deployed. <laughs> That's one of the best things. Have a playbook for how to fix what you just did. Um, and then what you do is clean that out and put the new version in. Or if you've got some mechanism like SCP or RSync or whatever it is with the uh, correct flag to say, make sure that what I send is exactly what ends there. So in other words, include right. deletes on the destination side because that's super important. Yeah. With a caveat, don't delete the images directly if you allow upload images because that's also, <laughs> ask me how I know. <laughs> but here's, that's a good point. Like, like um, symlinks, like soft symlinks, yeah, symlinks. Symlinks are just a great way to do it. By the way, symlinks are a term in Linux <clears throat> that you can link a virtual directory to an actual directory somewhere else. So that means you can mm. have your web or HTML directory, for example, link to a directory sitting somewhere else. And if you want to change yeah. the version, you can just change the sim link to something else. Mm. An excellent way to, to update it, things manually. So never yeah. overwrite files, <laughs> yes. no matter how certain you are, because you are never 100% certain. Uh, um, just a comment here for, from Saur. Uh, Saur Abashri, hmm? I'm sorry. Um, am I allowed here? I have no beard. It's the beard on yes. the inside that counts. Everybody's allowed here. We tend to um, spur out our beards for some reason because we cannot go <laughs> here. So uh, I think that's 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 the reason. Yes, um, it's a life choice. Okay, it's a life choice. Yes, this, <laughs> this is not a shaving um, accident. I promise. Really. Yeah. So um, so yeah. Even if you're going to do it manually, there are some things mm. that you can do. Like Hobu said, having a playbook, having a runbook that yeah. that tells exactly how to copy and replace the files when you need it, but also using things like symlinks. Mm. Can you do symlinks on Windows? I know you can have virtual mm -hmm. directories. You yeah, can. You can. It's, uh, um, jeepers, that will take me now back many years, more than a decade last that I used that. Um, but you can. I, I, there are some caveats. Too. There, were, there were some weird caveats with regards to applications and how they would traverse it and actually see it. Because yeah. in the command line, it would work. And something in my head now rings a bell saying that with apps, sometimes that didn't work depending on, I think mm -hmm. it was user permissions or something. It's, you know, something funky there that, that sometimes yeah. caused issues. Yeah. It's a bit different on Windows. So just <clears> bear in <throat> mind. Mm -hmm. And there's a comment here from Asantos. Uploaded files via FTP in an ASCII mode from Windows to Linux is really funny. All the file format will be broken and deployment will fail. So yes. Windows and Linux file formats, file landings, it can it can be it can be difficult. So sometimes just make sure you use the correct transfer methods mm. in this case. So um, yes, 
Control C, um, Control V at the same time. Yes. Uh, Noah, Noah Tree Perez says Control, Control, Control C and V. So copy and paste the code across. And yes, this leads me to my horror story of a place that I worked at um, when I walked in and looked at the deployment strategy, which was this a, a little bit more um, in the future because there was SVN mm -hmm. and we actually used that. So yes, that indicates how old I am. Um, but deployment consisted of step one, remote desktop to the production yeah. Windows machine. Okay. Step two, <laughs> SVN check out what was currently tagged as the current main branch. Okay. Step three, cherry pick. So SVN cherry pick commits from certain branches that had features on, because remember features are always just a little bit of code that you can just add to another bit of code and then they work, right? Okay. No, it's not. Um, and cherry pick merge all of those into this main branch rebranch that with a date suffix of main date mm -hmm. and then and here's the kicker open up visual studio click publish okay <laughs> on the production machine a visual studio on the production machine. <laughs> visual studio on the production machine because it had, a, it had a publish button that could connect to iis and then publish your application there mm -hmm, for you with mm -hmm. whatever values you needed yeah um <laughs> yeah <laughs> Bloody. I know that yeah, I know you have to do it in IS. Like I've never worked with IS too much, but mm. I know that you had to. Um... No, 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 no. You don't have to publish it. You don't have There's to. There's somebody. No, no. You could do publishing from the command line, and there are ways yeah, to do exactly. it. Yeah, it, exactly. It had things built in to yeah. actually um, handle the swap, swap over the all. There, there are better ways to do it. And it's built in. and It's there, but yeah, yep. That was just the way. <laughs> but let me tell you about my first deployment system, which is years back, which makes this even funnier, which was at the time where there were no like nice deployment mechanisms in place. It was a case of you need to SCP, CP your files to okay. um, the server and actually deployment. Mm -hmm. So did you ever work with Ant? No, I do not. Okay. So Ant, or for those in Windows, uh, they might have used it a, year, a couple of years later, Nant or NAT. Um, and basically it's a, You've got a lot of XML that you configure a build system with, and then okay. you have different build commands. So what we had, and by we, I mean the other smart guy that worked with Michael Sobremonte, um, had built a um, deployment system for us that would take our Java code, compile it, test it, zip it up um, okay. in the format that we needed for JBoss deployments, generate an MD5 hash for that. Then based on whatever config for deployment, we did, it would SCP it across. On the other side, something watched for the file and would see that it was uploaded, then go grab the MD5 hash separately, because mm -hmm. otherwise you're kind of defeating the purpose of doing MD5 hash checking. Check that the MD5 hash matches and that it's there. And then we would go in, and it was still manual deploys, but the manual deploy consisted of an ant deploy command that we would execute on the server. Because we, that scenario was we had to have downtime yeah. due to how JBoss handled the application with the things that we had in it. So it was like JBoss down. So we had this, when we did deployments, we were always um, on headphones or in the room talking together, like saying, okay, JBoss is down, hit deploy, deploy. And we used screens so everybody could have the same terminal yeah. open in front of them. Then you see, okay, cool, deployment is running, running, running. As soon as it's done, you say, cool, JBoss up, and boom, it went up again, and Ant handled all of this for us. And like I said, this was years ago. Yeah. Um, but Ricardo. Yeah, we have Ricardo here. Hi. Yeah. Um, we can actually, you know, you can have manual deployments and, and still be okay. It's not very, it's not very yeah. your time value, your time value friendly, but um, it's, uh, it is possible. It is possible to do that. Mm. Um, uh, Alex Masha, hey, welcome back. We haven't seen you here yeah. in a while. Well, no, Tree Perez, have you guys read Internet of Thing by Bruce Sterling? I have not read that. No, um, let me put that uh, on my list. Let's put Where's it on my the list? list. By the way, uh, if you want to see a botch deployment, so think about it like this. If Cobus wanted to deploy to Berlin, you get me. Almost the same, but not exactly. A bit a slightly worse version than Cobus because of a manual deployment. So <laughs> think of us the two versions running in two different regions. Um, but yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh hey Chris, Chris is here. Um, <laughs> manual deployment nightmare flashbacks. Everybody has manual deployment nightmare flashbacks. Oh yeah. But again, don't be don't be um, dissuaded by that. It's okay to have manual deployments mm. sometimes if you cannot. Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. We've got it. We've got it. We I've got the... We uh, where's, where's the banner? There we go. Yes. It it's depends. okay to have manual deployments sometimes. So just be careful yeah. not to rely on manual deployments for really big things. Mm. And especially if you value your time and sanity. So um, 
um, then let's actually, let's move on from manual deployments. And, you know, we can talk horror stories. We can talk about good things with manual deployments, you know, your link, your mm. sim links, all those things. But um, let's talk about you automated don't deployments. I don't want, you know, you, yeah. don't, you want to try to move away mm. from that. And luckily, in the world of 2021, there are so many tools out there. There are so many mm -hmm. frameworks, platforms, services, all the things that help you actually automatically deploy your code. Um, and there's a lot of things about automatically deploying your code. So, um, yeah, um, hmm. let's talk about them, Kogus. So, how do we start? What is the... What Very is the, simple. Okay. There's one place most people would start, and this once oh. again gives away my age, and I, I remember I had to explain this to you, is Hudson. <laughs> oh, yeah, I still don't know what Hudson is, so <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Hudson is, is literally just a fork that is now called Jenkins. So, Hudson was the original... <sighs> Um, okay. And then they forked away and, uh, and created uh, Jenkins from it. Jenkins. Yeah. So the fun thing here is even nowadays, if you look in the Jenkins code base, there's still a lot of the class libraries and things called Hudson. Um, oh. I mean, yeah, I remember the Butler icon was a bit different, but I okay. can't remember what it looked like anymore. Yeah. Well, to be honest, like Jenkins, like I, I'm, I'm a fan of Jenkins, but when you look at, I, I haven't used Jenkins in a while, but a few years back, Jenkins UI seems like it's from your period. <laughs> it is a bit wow. Shots fired. Eh? Your period. <laughs> it's a bit dated. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, yes. Yeah, here's the thing. Um, use what works. If you've use got a lot works, of people exactly. familiar uh, with uh, Jenkins, and if it gets the job done, I, use it. I, I'm not saying Jenkins is bad by any means. It's an amazing tool. People get so much things done with Jenkins. I'm just saying it looks dated which not is not necessarily bad because if you ever follow anything i post on twitter i love old things i love how old things look and yeah so just keep up the work jenkins don't change well what you can do is you can use jenkins x i'm trying to see now what the ui looks like because i've never actually fired it up but i'm assuming it looks a bit different jenkins but, yeah. x is the is the is the commercial version right um oh uh, no, no no that will be cloud bees uh, jenkins yes, x cloud is the kubernetes native type version ah, in the okay. sense that you put it on Kubernetes and it knows how to spin up Kubernetes clusters and deploy to it, etc., and all of those things. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, oh, so many comments here that we have. Yeah. yeah you go first. Mm. Let's comment on, on what Ricardo says. Um, before Jenkins, I used Continuum, which got me interested in this approach. I don't know what Continuum is. Mm. <laughs> like that may show my age. I don't know. Uh, so. That is something that is a oh, yeah. bit different, but and there's then, a bunch of comments here. Go ahead. Oh yeah. Um, the other one was here, as long as it's not using Java applets for the web UI. I see that and I raise you uh, Jay Goody's Java development more than how many, 12, 13 years ago. Um, and before uh, Jay Goody's, which made our life super useful because Jay Goody's allowed you to do like column-based designs in your UI, we used Java Swing directly with okay. we have to always calculate where the icons and things are and doing things like resizing the window was a nightmare because you had to figure out relative to how to the other buttons things how the buttons are going to resize manage okay. all of that madness and then we moved to J Goodies and it was so good um, and I think we moved from that to JSF um, Java server faces um, and from Java server faces we moved one more there was one more before I want to say it was the Google Toolkit uh, JTK mm -hmm. or what is it called uh, way back, but like I said, this is not many years ago. I can't remember anymore. Um, yeah. But yeah, so no, don't don't joke those. We we went through those stages. We dealt with that. Lots I still of fun. remember. I still remember f websites that had like a Java applet. GWT. To... There we go. <laughs> and it's Ian. Good evening. Hey Ian. Hey, good evening, Ian. It's a bit late to you, I think. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but good good evening and welcome to the stream. Um, so let's talk about automated deployments. Um, mm. There's a lot of tools built in. Like we we mentioned something yeah. Jenkins, we mentioned Hudson, Continuum. Um, there's a, as I said, there's there's a plethora of tools mm. available for you to automatically deploy. Now, we're not going to go ahead and say, hey, use this tool, use that tool, because mm. if a tool is used correctly and it is, you know, good, um, it should do the job for you. Again, we work for AWS, and I, my, most of my deployment experience comes from code deploy, uh, but some people might have other experiences and, and all the stuff. So let's talk about if you're automatically deploying code, how, what different strategies do you have to deploy your code? Ooh, Bef before we before. get to that point, we first have to cover the two different ways to do that. Push okay. versus pull. Ah, Because it's okay. important, yes. 
because it depends on how you approach this. Because um, if you want to get code onto a server, there are only two ways you can do that. Either okay. you initiate a connection to the server, so it needs to have a port open and you need to have credentials that you give it to be allowed in. And let's think SCP or um, whatever protocol you use to get the files into the server. Okay. And then the second way is if the server somehow knows how to pull the code at a specific point, which typically means that there's some kind of agent or daemon running on the actual server itself that connects somewhere or listens somewhere and does things. So those okay. are the two things, and there are trade-offs with both. Because on the one hand, if you go the pull method, you need to install a daemon. That daemon yes. needs to actually connect to central location. Central location needs to be available. It needs to keep common comms and be the same version, manage the agent, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Whereas with pushing it, it sounds simpler because guess what? You don't need anything on the machine, but you need access to the machine. And that's often right. a, a blocker, especially in regulated environments. But there's also there's also a, 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 a kind of a mix of that approach. Now, when when you when you when I hear push versus pull, um, for me a pull is if you ever used Chef and you did use Chef in the past, mm. Chef is in, for my case a very typical pull method. Now it's not code deployment; it's configuration deployment. It's a very pull method because the agent checks mm. in every fifteen minutes, asking, "Hey, do you have new things for me? And if you do, give them to me." Mm. But code deploy has an agent running on an instance. Mm. And it doesn't pull. It sits there and listens until the service says, hey, here's code, deploy it. So I think that's kind of a mix between the two because there's a thing running on the box what's listening but, to it. But I would expect, because my experience with code deploy is that there's, you don't need to open up a port on the box for that. The actual no, agent self connect. It connects outwards. So yes, yeah, yeah. while you push code through that connection, the connection right. is initiated from the agent. And okay, then that, that is how the communication, yeah. So fair point, fair, fair point, fair point. Yeah. Okay, so push versus pull. Um, yes. My, 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 all my experiences were, again, with code deploy because I, I have the most experience with that. Uh, but again, there are other versions and that can be, as Kobo said, the, the push method where you actually push code to an instance without anything mm. listening on the other side can be a problem because you need to open some mm. transport ports between them and those can be you know your SSHs or STPs or FTPs whatever you want um, yeah. and SMBs but just be careful about mm. those things because they can they can cause more problem than they, they can give things um, yeah so uh, so when, when it comes to automated deployment scopus um, there are yes. three big ones we like to talk about um, in place blue green and canary Yes. There's a mix of both all of them to an extent, but let's talk mm. about, let's start off with the in-place deployments. Yeah. What are in-place deployments? <laughs> well, exactly what you would expect. It's like you've got a deployment and you replace it in place. So exactly where this thing at the moment is, you put the new version there. Now, the, the how you do the there is once again, like we've mentioned, there are a couple of ways of doing it. Different directories, switch a sim link, back it up, zip it, yeah. move it, or um, literally just another folder, change a config in web server, say, okay, now you point there or yeah. yeah. So that's, that's basically in place, in place. Or if your web server deploys, there are even some code um, or some of them that deploy, deploy uh, brain, engage, sorry, long night kids, um, that support in place deployments or hot deployments where you yeah. send the package directly to the web server and say, listen, here's the new version. It knows how to put that in place while routing connections that come into that new version instead of the old version, etc. cetera. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Sorry, quick question here about rolling versus in place. Um, difference there is that um, we're going to get to rolling deployments where you do bit by bit or blue green or canary or shifting traffic. So we will cover rolling, but in place in this case is literally like you've got the site up, boom, new version is up, immediately everything goes there. Yeah, exactly. The, the, the only difference is between rolling and, and, and not rolling is that rolling just does it in increments, it deploys the code yeah. in increments. Uh, there are ways you can just immediately deploy the same, the new version to all of your web servers. How good is that? Automated There's... YOLO. No, no, that oh, one's called automated, automated YOLO. YOLO. Automated YOLO. <laughs> so, mm. so be careful if you're using that. And there's a use case for that. Like if you need mm. to just immediately switch through all the versions at once, eh, be careful. Or here's a kicker, if it doesn't matter. Yeah. Here's the thing. Let's say you've got a website that's purely outbound yeah. people view pages. Correct. If it suddenly changes under them, that's not going to break functionality for them or anything. It's like it, it's that's often the biggest discussion because you might have a chat with someone saying like, "Listen, well, how does your application have handle the sick term signals that the OS sends to it when it goes into shutdown mode with regards to hot uh, connections that are currently being made?" You kind of go like, 
it doesn't matter. Why would yeah. I spend time on that? So there's a very big, it depends in this whole discussion. Yes, yes, exactly. Because if, if even if there is a tool or an automated way to do it to make it perfect, maybe you don't need it. There's mm. just no need sometimes to do it. Like a lot of companies can't have downtime in a sense that you can just, yep. you know, or, or have a change with static content that will not impact things. The problem is if you make a change that is not backwards compatible, so if you make a change that will change the database or or make something like that that your current code cannot no longer work, that's mm -hmm. a problem where you would have yeah. to change it all at once. So yeah. <clears throat> once you start deploying, let's let's talk about rolling deployments, right? So let's say you have a cluster of 15 servers and these 15 servers you run your amazing web application on. And you want to deploy the latest the latest version of your PHP code. What you start doing is gradually deploying that code. So take the first 10% of the servers, deploy the code, see if it works, continue. Deploy the code, see if it works, continue. Just doing that constantly. Mm -hmm. Now, what I might, what I actually described here is canary deployments. Um, uh, no, 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 no. I was about almost. to say that see that it works is the important yeah, part. That exactly, that's the thing. Yeah. For rolling deployments, see that it works means Process started up and accepts connection. Yeah. Nothing more. Yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. So, um, you you deploy it, see if it works. Is it has it start up? Hot started up, and if it if it has, good. Let's continue forward. Mm -hmm. And I'll explain how CodeDeploy does this. And other tools do it very similarly. So there's no magic to CodeDeploy. So what happens here? Um, I used to be a subject matter expert on CodeDeploy in my former team. Ooh, so I, sheesh, I, I still sheesh. I still I still remember things. Um, your code, so you announce new version of your code to code deploy and tell it, make a role and deploy 20% of the time. Yeah, an SME. <laughs> so uh, you, it takes the artifact you have and chooses 20% of the instances and takes the code, copies it to the instance and replaces the code. It just changes the code in production. Now, there's a bunch of things you can tell it to, like before replacing the code, stop this service or run this script or do that or do, do the other thing. It replaces the code, starts up the the new uh, the new script or starts up the, the the applications and see if it has successfully started up. If it has, it reports back to to a code deploy saying, "Hey, the deployment has been successful. Carry on." Uh, so, <coughs> so in, in that sense, is is it, 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 that's a kind of a, a, a rolling deployment that checks, mm. does the code work or has it started? Uh, no, no, the, I want to say one beautiful thing about code deploy is that um, it can roll back. So if, it, if the code has broken, if the code cannot start, it will say unsuccessful deployment and automatically replace the files with the old versions because code deploy by default keeps five versions of the code somewhere on the box. Yes. Yeah. I would be able to tell you if you give me a keyboard and I can auto-complete because I used to do that a lot. Go in to look at the old deployments, scratch around, see what was wrong. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Darko's me. Yes, Darko is Kobus. Uh, <laughs> Super Mario expert. I would like to call myself a Super Mario expert because I played Super Mario a lot, uh, but not an expert. Mm. Uh, <laughs> uh, Kluth, we are not twins. We are almost twins. Um, we're actually... We're separated by at least 10,000 kilometers. Um, he's based in mm. South Africa. I'm based in Berlin. Um, and uh, yes, um, it's the beard and the baldness that gives it away. Hence, um, the beard offs. Uh, yes. So, but um, <laughs> fun, fun story quickly with code deploy. So back in the days where uh, there's a saying that says, I'm not young enough to know everything. Um, yeah. <laughs> I used to, you know, be able to solve every single problem I came across. I mean, I was young enough for that. And nowadays I'm like, wow, it depends. Let me find out a little bit more first. Yeah. But um, basically then back then it was like, this was before container orchestrations systems were popular. And I was like, I love code deploy. We're moving from yeah. code deploy, uh, from deploying directly to using containers. So you know what? I can do bash. I'll write some start and stop scripts and deployment scripts that I bundle into my code deploy. And that's how we do it. Yeah. Fun fact here is that this is where I had to learn because uh, I knew about exit codes in the operating system and the maximum is 128, I believe, um, yep. in terms of the yep. default value. Except the code deploy was throwing an exit code 137 for, okay. which is like, yeah, because I was going like, that's not possible, then digging into it. And then what it boils down to that is that there's an overflow mechanism. If this 
process was killed okay. by another process. It would add that other process's kill code on top of it or something like that. Basically, it means okay. that there was another process involved, which was the first hint. Because what I had done is that there is, when the container is running, there was a process there that I needed to, to kill. And I searched for the, um, I can't remember exactly what the thing was, but four or five letters based on that, because that was the default that we call it, uh, yeah. call it. No worries. Worked on all the services except this one, because this one service's um, zip file or some part of the code deploy system ended up having those first four letters as the pro uh, process name. And okay. then what would happen is code deploy would execute the script that does the deployment that kills the process, which is code deploy, and then flop. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's, Lesson that's here, question. don't deploy your can containers by hand. Use yeah. the things that are available for it. <laughs> There's always tools yeah. out there available to help you with that. So please try to use them. It will make your lives easier. Yeah. Um, mm. a, a comment here from, uh, from ZB underscore C. Does the rollback happen automatically or do you need some sort of a setup? Like deploy v3 if v4 fails. Um, mm. In code deploy, it's all automatic. So what, what will happen with code deploy, if you are deploying a new version of code in your rolling deployment, if the deployment fails, that is if the service cannot start, uh, it automatically f fails back or rolls back to the previous good version, which is <laughs> most likely the previous version running the code. Bring up your little thingy. There's one caveat here. Okay. Which is if you had a scaling event during deployment time, because yes. remember, it needs to have the previous copy on the physical server. So what happens Correct. is if you start deploying and you bring up a new service uh, or new server, at that point, it'll speak to code deploy. So listen, give me the latest version, which is now the yeah. version being deployed. And then when it tries to deploy that, that deployment fails, yeah. there is no previous zip to go back to. So that it's a bit of an edge case, um, but it is an interesting one to deal with. Yeah, so there are a couple of things, but usually if it's on a fixed infrastructure mm -hmm. thing that doesn't scale as much, um, uh, you can quite easily roll back to the previous version without anything you have to do. So it's all automatic. Mm. Um, yeah, ZBC mm. had the exact same issue. It's been a pain. Mm. And I get that. And and sometimes it had happened. And I, again, I worked in premium support and I worked with customers who had the exact same problem. Mm -hmm. uh, deployment would fail during a scale event and then they cannot get the, the good version on it. The thing what happens there is the, fame, the deployment will fail and it will cancel itself. So the deployment will yeah. no longer run. When your scaling yeah. happen, event happens again, it will actually deploy the latest version of the code. So the, the, or the previous the latest, version. The, if the it previous is. version, yeah. Yeah, so, mm. yeah uh, I was going to say, because that's, that, that's one way to do it. But just remember here, you need to link your um, EC2 instance, the scaling. When you look yeah. at the, the health check, it needs to be your ALB or ELB and not um, EC2. Because what can happen is that if the instance comes up and its health check is just EC2, it means if the basic health checks is, is the box up and responsive, um, passes, that box will stay up. Right. Whereas if you link it to the uh, load balancer, the load balancer says, this instance is not healthy, let me kill it. What will happen then is you had the bad deployment, it can't start up. Yeah. Load balancer takes a bit of time to see that it's not working. Kill it off, spins up a new one, and that's then when what Darko talks about, the old deployment kicks in. Correct, 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 correct. Uh, cool. Um, so let's kind of move on from rolling deployments. So rolling deployments how are... To get, how to get away from these problems. How to get away from these problems. Because rolling deployments, while they are good and simple and you know can, can solve most <clears throat> of your problems, there are better ways to do it. So there are yeah. different ways. I wouldn't call them better, but there are different ways to do it. They have all of their own ups and downs. But um, let's talk about the thing called uh, blue-green deployments. So yes. blue-green deployments. What are blue-green? Or they used to be called sometimes blue-red. I've heard a lot of different approaches. There you go, blue-green. I was looking for something blue and green. I don't have anything. Um, I've got this cough medicine <laughs> and uh, what's this Q20? Q okay. Uh, so what are blue-green deployments? Let me actually try to... Illustrate. I have things here, but they're not blue and green. Oh, um, they're hard. Pretend they're blue and so, green. Pretend this is blue. Um, this is your current running version of your website sitting on your server, right? And then you decide, um, hey, I want to deploy the latest version of my code. But instead of copying the code to this disk or to this set of servers, you actually spin up an exact copy of the same cluster twice. And this exact copy gets the latest version of your code. So you deploy the code on, 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 the, on the new cluster, on the new things running, new instances, new, new set of net, all the things, right? And see if it works. Does it start up correctly? Um, you know, any problems happening on there? You can actually test it out before um, 
before it goes to production. You can have a, a specific separate mm. URL or endpoint to test out your green version of the code. Yeah. Then if green works, if you are satisfied with it, you say, okay, let me switch traffic. So what happens on top, on the, on the network layer, on the load balancer, you basically reroute traffic from blue mm. to green, and then green is blue. Then green is the, the thing that runs your code right now, and this mm. is what is serving your customers. Yeah. Why is this good, Cobus? What helps us? What does blue green do for us? It's great because if you stuff up, you just go back to the traffic layer and say, please send everything to where it came from before. Yes. This new version doesn't work, which means that it's such a case of configs, boof, the traffic shifts. And we're talking about milliseconds to seconds in terms of doing that. Well, okay, big caveat here, sorry. I need to, because I've seen this. If you use a load balancer to handle that kind of routing for you, if you're using DNS, um, mm -hmm. that is up to 48 hours. Also, once again, ask me how I know how you can screw up a production that way. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> You, so, you, you don't want to use DNS to, or to rely on DNS to do no, a, a, no, a version no. change. No. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. A, a very good point. So if I had a banner, I would put it up. Do not re rely on DNS for um, mm. version changes because it's DNS. Yeah. Uh, Once again, caveat, unless you're using root 30, 53 okay. health checks, there's some very smart things in there that does things with virtual and IPs and things, but I'm well. talking about gen general DNS. If you have your own DNS that you manage and you clickety-click, don't do this. Yeah. There's a way to do it yeah. with Route 53 mm -hmm. because Route 53 has aliases and health yeah. checks, and uh, aliases actually can do much faster reroutes or changes mm -hmm. in the back end than, than your DNS DNS mm -hmm. request. I have no idea how that works, but uh, there there's a <laughs> it works in some way. Um, yeah. So, so using this network layer, using this load balancer, the endpoint, the API gateway, whatever you have on the front to just point it to different backends. It, well, it doesn't have to be a backend per se, it, mm. to different code sources, to, to different uh, set of servers, to a different cluster, to a different bucket, to something else that contains your new version of code. And as Koba mm. said, if this fails on you, you can just easily just, okay, flip back to the other one because I know yeah. that one works. And the beauty of it, it's, it's instant. So it is, <laughs> it is, it is, it, once you flip the switch, all of your customers mm. will get the new version yep. or the old version of the code. So, which is both good and bad. Yeah. Because it's great if yeah. it works. Good case scenario. It's okay. bad if 100% of your customers are unhappy because guess what? Your site just broke. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so Ian has a comment here. Um, I've had conflicting arguments on exact difference, but red black is a specialization of blue green that forces traffic to be only targeted at one endpoint rather than the tiny period where there could be both traffic to both. Well, okay. So in my view, mm. there's only traffic to one. Um, and now I'm, I may, may be conflicting things, but when I think of blue green, when I say a traffic sh switch, I mean immediate traffic switch to just one. So mm. your customers are hitting blue at one point, and once you're happy with green, just switch them all over to green. Um, so um, maybe we're talking something different here, but uh, maybe there's another version of blue green. I, I don't know. Like I haven't heard about it. So um, feel free to put your comment. Idea. Sorry. Um, I'm quickly Googling it, and the okay. first hint that I have is exactly this. Uh, it's from Developer Zone, um, okay. which says, in blue-green deployment, both versions may be getting requests at the same time, temporarily, Okay. while red-black, only one of the versions is getting traffic at any point in time. And this is what you said, is because when you do that traffic switch over, there is a case of some connections still on the old version, okay. while okay. most are being moved to the new one. Yeah. It's, it's, it could be due to session stickiness, I would say. Mm. Like that, That's my question here. Is that due to session stickiness? Or is that due to the fact that I will still allow a certain percentage of my users to use mm. the old version? Because that's a different thing then. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. Um, but okay, yeah, I, I have not mm. used it. I mean, in my mind, you would most of the time immediately switch over mm. all the customers. And there will be some session stickiness. For example, if somebody has a session open on a registration page or, or a shopping cart, they will most likely stay on the old one until the connections drain, and then they will start using the new version. Lots of it depends, is there, in terms of your architecture. Yeah, your, if you preferably have you don't have cookies. sticky sessions, yeah. Right. Well, you can have session cookies, uh, 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 you know, mm. stored somewhere externally and then use it like that, so um, mm. for, for that case, but 
sometimes it's neither, right? You don't want to j- yeah. d- drop people off in the middle of their shopping and they will b- not buy mm-hmm. anything. Um, so, 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 so from that perspective, that's kind of a thing. Mm. But um, I mean, the, the challenge with this is that we have this problem of either everybody goes over or nobody goes over and it's either everything is broken or everything is good, which obviously is not ideal. Yeah. Which is no, why we've so. got more. It's yep. expensive. And? It's expensive. You have to have double yes. the capacity at all. Um, um, so mm, that's a problem. N- n- you have to have double capacity during the period of during deployment. The deployment. Yeah. Not, yeah. not at all times. Which, if you're in the cloud world and you can just elastic spin up some extra yeah. ones per second billing, that's not too bad. Um, so th- except, caveat, okay. if you ever hear the term high watermark billing, Beware. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. I got, so I had this beautiful deployment set up a few years back, which we used auto scaling groups. We uh, baked our AMIs every Sunday to be fully patched with all the versions and things. And what happened is Monday morning for the development environment, we updated the auto scaling group to the new okay. AMI. Um, and then it would double capacity because then it brings up using the new AMI. And okay. then our de- uh, termination policy was oldest first. So what it would then do is then okay. use the new AMI, deploy the code onto it with code deploy, make sure everything's working, and then 15 minutes later it would shut down um, or drop half the capacity again, which means it deleted the old half. So every Monday we could just flip our servers, which is awesome. Um, okay. Except during that period we had double the normal count of servers running for that 15 minute period. So yeah. four or five times a month, depending on how many weeks and where the Monday fell, we had twice as many. And then the, after the first month of implementing this, we got a bill from one of our third-party um, services, and it was <laughs> double. Because yeah. guess what? We suddenly had 30 servers instead of 15, so we're billing you for 30. And that's where we went like, whoa, have you got yeah. per minute billing or something? Yeah, yeah. be careful about that. Uh, you know. Mm. So when we're talking not in the cloud, when we're talking your own infrastructure, in that case, you need to have double infrastructure. You need to have double capacity. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, you need to, uh, if you're doing licensing, be careful of the high watermark licensing, yeah. as, as, Co- as, as Kobe said. Mm. If you have high watermark licensing, you will be billed for the amount, highest amount of services you mm. use at one point. So be careful about that. Mm. But if you're in the cloud, you only need this capacity or you need to scale up to double the amount of things you do during deployments. Now, that can be, that's, in any case, more expensive than not having that because mm. you have to spin up the the copy of your production system, um, at, at least a part portion of your co- uh, production mm. um, twice, uh, so so you can handle the new load or the new version, mm. which 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 can be a problem, right? So I, I've I've mm. spoken to customers that I've I've I suggested that they do blue green, and they said they cannot because it's too expensive. And it's mm. it's fine if you have five servers, right? It's not expensive, but if you have a, a five thousand server cluster, then you can have a mm. problem with that. So uh, yeah, mm. um, just to answer a couple of questions uh, here, uh, yes. we have a couple of things here. Uh, Gala God, is that session stickiness depending on the ALB? Uh, yes, the load balancer has session session stickiness um, configured on itself, and as long as yes. there are sessions enabled on it, it will drain the connections and then it will release them all. So. And caveat to that as well as certain web servers, depending on how you build the application, might be, um, contain yeah. server-side context of yeah. the user connection in that one server, which means if your request now routes elsewhere, that context is gone. So that's also where you get stickiness, which is why we would want that on the load balancer to make the session sticky. Exactly. And if, if, you, if you're using like cookies for your sessions, the best thing is to have, especially on a clustered system, to have uh, cookies stored elsewhere, for example, like an elastic cache. Uh, cluster mm. or a memcache somewhere externally that you can query those cookies uh, yeah. no matter what the production system is running. Yeah. Um, um, Stephen Mangudi, uh, are you recording the live cast? Absolutely. So this yes. uh, this live cast, the stream will be available on that not Cobus, not Darko YouTube channel. Um, so make sure mm. to check them out there. And all the previous ones are there. If you want to hear and hit the subscribe button, smash the blocky button and all the stuff. Um, so we, we, we post all of the content there. Um, mm. these are all streams. So it's, if you, if you like to listen to two guys talk about some technology, um, <laughs> in the background, so please do, please do that. Mm. We're always happy to do that. Um, Noah three Perez, what is high water licensing? Um, ah, Cobus. So for those of you that have um, been to a beach and seen it, is that typically say there's some uh, debris on either the beach itself or in the ocean, let's say like branches or um, rubbish or something. What happens yeah. is as the, the tide comes in and it comes to high water, at some point it reaches the peak where this is the highest the water ever goes and it goes away again. And what that results in is on the actual beach itself, because they all tend to be a bit slanted. 
it will leave a line of debris that you can literally see. And that's called the high watermark. Now, how this applies to licensing is that yeah. we look at the graph of all the different servers in terms of how many you have. Whatever was the peak, so the highest instance count at any point in a time period, so for example, a month, um, we use that as the mechanism to bill you for. So in the one I gave is that if we spike to 50 servers once in the month and the rest of the time we run 20 servers, we will be billed for 50 servers, not 20, because we're using the high watermark um, licensing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So sometimes some services are doing that. Um, again, I, I don't think there's any service in AWS that does that if you, unless you're doing unless you are doing workspaces because if you're using workspaces mm. per month billing even if you've spin up a workspace just for a, a day uh you will be charged for the entire month if you're using per month building so be careful on the high watermark billing approaches especially on blue mm. green but it doesn't apply in this case so mm -mm. what i said yeah. Mm. um uh yeah uh, thank you very much uh zbc for for, for the feedbacks uh we, we we like that you enjoy the stream so f please do come back every week mm. um Bokyo, um, it's going to take a few days to test everything people, uh, um, everything automatic and dedicated QA people do as well. That's a great point. Mm. So blue green, it's not as instant as you think. If yep. you launch, you know, your, 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 your blues and your greens, and then sometimes the green environment, the new code needs to be up for a day or two, because you have QA, you have people, you have user acceptance testing, a bunch of different testing, testing it in a production scale mm. approach to see if that works. And then once they're satisfied, somebody hits the switch button mm. and then it goes to actual production production. Mm. So that's where the cost can also come in. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> um, quickly, just to have a further question on the um, uh, high watermark billing here um, from Noah Tree Perez, which is, and that is for the billing deployment strategy in some case, am I stunning? Uh, yes, so what it does is that, in this case, it was a third party application we installed on the server that yeah. did um, some things for us. And what they said is that every single time we see a copy of that, we count the total copies at any point in time, whatever the most is. So literally every time you spin up a new box and it's one more than the previous, you charge for one more. Whereas if you shut down one other machine and you spin up um, a new one and you add the, then it would be the same cost because you had six, then you had five, then you had six. So the highest is six. Yeah, exactly. So cool. it, it yeah. applies sometimes, especially if you have specific software, mm. specific licensing on something. So be careful mm. on that. Uh, Ian says ACM PCA2, if he recalls correctly. So there could be mm. some AWS services that, but again, in this case, it doesn't doesn't really apply to to mm. well, should not apply to mm. to your to your um, blue green deployments, especially mm. on a more traditional approach. But just be be mindful of that. Mm. But okay. we have got seven and a half minutes left, and we yeah. need to cover. Uh, traffic shifting and also canary deployments. Um, and just before we get in there, just a quick injection about containers and why they are so popular with this as well. It's like we how, just how about, described... this? how about this? Let's leave canary deployments and observability for production for next week, and we'll okay. just finish up with this thing. So next week we're going to continue on canary deployments and the other things. Still deploy deployment strategies, but right now let's talk about let's finish off containers and um, mm. and traffic shifting. Mm. So the big benefit that came up about with containers is the fact that your entire application is, is uh, contained. Um, get it? Which means that in this blue green world, um, when you spin up a second version, remember on a server, you tend to have to worry about the runtime, the libraries, the versions, yeah. all of those things, which means you can't necessarily, if you, let's say you're jumping from Java 7 to Java 8, yeah. well, that can't remember if Java 7 actually came out. Um, you need to install that runtime, be able to reference it, et cetera, where with containers, it's inside this little box. So version seven is up and running. You can bring up a second one with version eight and your new version of the code. The only thing is that you obviously need to make sure that there aren't any port conflicts and that you can handle have on the load balance level to be able yeah. to shift traffic then on a yeah. port basis. So just quickly, that's one of the ways you can avoid the cost scenario. Uh, with a caveat, obviously you've got capacity with memory to actually spin up yeah. a second version on the same machine. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So. Mm. A lot of times when you deploy um, blue green on different different machines, um, you will use a different set of ports, right? Mm. Um, e like even if not, you're not doing containers, you will use a different port for the endpoint. But especially for yeah. containers, I think that's that's key because I remember a time when you could like just have a single port like on a, on a container that can be only bound to a single one, no dynamic porting Ooh. and all that stuff. So uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, be careful with that. Um, so so yeah, oh, yeah, but containers make it much easier. I would say that containers mm. make it so much simpler because it's it's just a container that can sit on any machine. So you don't have to worry too much about actually deploying the code. 
the copying of the code and all those things. So yeah. Mm. Thank you for all the amazing com uh, comments, uh, Noah, uh, Saurab, and Fong Quenti. Uh, we love that you enjoyed these things and please do tune in more often um mm. every wednesday we do the same thing so join us uh, we like talking about these kind of things uh, we tend to go on tangents so for example today we wanted to cover it all but hey um <laughs> you never you never can with these things so we we keep on just so are we are, are we gonna are we gonna do the traffic shaping or we leave that for next time to leave them let's, hanging so they have to let's, come back let's, yeah let's let's, let's do a cliffhang cliffhanger next week at the same time at don't, the same don't, place. Don't. yeah we're going to be continuing talking about deployment strategies and talking about traffic shifting, canary deployments, but also observability in production or actually monitoring stuff mm. in production. Follow, subscribe, and all the smash things. Yeah. <laughs> Ian, and you keep on, keep on distracting us and we'll just stream. Uh, we don't mind. Mm. <laughs> I can actually g give you the ultimate cliffhanger. Okay. At some point, and I, I'm not going to promise when because I need to drag this out as much as possible. Okay. I will tell you the story about... I got fired because of Jira time estimates in terms of the projected release date. Ooh. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> and by, by fired, I mean it was literally a case of Sunday afternoon. Hey, by the way, this is happening. Yeah. Here's your ticket. Tomorrow morning, you're on the plane. And you're going back home. Wow. So, yeah. <laughs> Um, <laughs> okay, a question here from Noob Power. Hi, Darko and Kerbus. Thank you for your content. A little question. In your opinion, what is the best deployment strategy for state machines and step functions? Okay, so go ahead, Kerbus. I will, I will leave this one to you because I really don't know. The one that works for you. Oh! <laughs> We're sorry. It's it's a horrible answer. But, no, uh, no, no, no. Okay, uh, apologies. I've got the correct answer. I just need to click on it again, which is... Yeah. Cool. Um, so for state machines, so the reason here is that um, in a state machine, you've got lots of different functions that you can pull and it depends uh, in, in terms of like those versioning. So yeah. the first question I would ask is, are these functions all inside the same single project? Because if that's the case, there is a way where, remember when you deploy a Lambda function, there's always an alias created for latest. But, yep. they, but when you deploy a new version, you do have the previous versions available. I think it's up to the last 10 if memory serves, but it could be five, um, which means what you can do is explicitly yep. in your state machine, define the version of the Lambda function in, uh, and not use latest. So for example, use the hash of the build yep. or a version or something, which means that you can then go deploy the newer version of the Lambda function. And this applies as well if you've got multiple different repos. And then once you're ready, then what you do is you update your state machine to say, okay, cool, now use these new ones. Now granted, okay. what will happen then is when the state machine is in, in progress, my understanding at least, and I'll have to go double check is, or let me rephrase this. The expected behavior I would have is that once the state starts executing, it'll use whatever it was configured with at that point correct, in time correct. to then use, because yeah. you don't want to change flow mid process. You, sh no, um, you should never do that. It can cause yeah. problems. So my yeah, my expectation is this is how the state machine and state functions would work, is that complete the execution of that state yeah. uh, in terms of the state machine and then only use the new state because you could change the flow and everything. Um, the problem, problem, so that's the problem is with long-running state machines. If you have a long-running yes. state machine, and that can happen, you can have 24-hour long-running long, mm. uh, long state machine, so that's a problem. Even mm. in that case, you do not want to change it mid midway because you don't know yes. what kind of a change it, it impacts the entire flow. Mm. But it does come down to how near real time do you want this to kick in? Because if you think about it this way, is that I want to deploy right now, which means which changes the flow of how I do things. Yeah. This there's a reason for this, but this reason was fine five minutes ago. So if this one transaction still finishes in the old way, whatever I'm doing, I obviously have a strategy yeah. to change that data or correct the data or deal with that data. So just think about how to apply that to running processes and once they complete, how to flag them and process them. Correct. 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 <sighs> Okay, well, we hope that answers your question, uh, New Power. Um, before we head off, uh, can I shill something? I, I you know, I, I, I love shilling stuff on this stream. Uh, we, we, we haven't used the, we haven't used the, 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 the shill, shill jar uh, in a while, and I think yeah. Kobus has lost it, so I'm good. So I would no, like no, to. No, 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 I've got it. You got it. Okay. But, uh, okay. Just remember, my, my sidekick might not approve. <laughs> That's a flashback. <laughs> So um, I just want to share a, a thing I've been working on. I, I've been working on like writing more and just, you know, spending every day to do a bit of blogging. Um, I, I, I found that I enjoy it a bit more now. And I've actually have a small blog thing I have written and where I post random things. They're all tech related. 
uh, but they're not necessarily it always AWS related. So um, if you are interested in learning how I do things with Vim and, and my colors and, oh, yeah. and the LOL banners and, and and I even have some things with, what, what, did, what did I talk about? Like installing Windows 2000 on a physical hardware. Um, so check out the blog. Um, there is no subscribe or follow button on. There is an RSS feed if you're into RSS feeds because yeah. Uh, yes, <laughs> Mr. Sidekick. Uh, Can I so get yeah, the make, make, it's, smash the uh, RSS subscribe button. Working. Yeah. Oh man, I wish we had RSS more. Where is Google Reader? Yeah. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I miss that. <laughs> Check it out if 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 you find that find that interesting. Um, and yeah, mm. I keep on trying to post every week something there. So it's 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 a bit of a a, a, a tongue in cheek post, a bit more on technology. Oh, bye. Okay, we are on. Everybody, we need thank to go. Thank you very much. Thank Next you. week, same time. Goodbye. We love you.